Hello and welcome everyone uh, to our brief, The Growing Climate Workforce, How Policies Today Could Shape the Jobs of Tomorrow. You know, it's been a while since we've done one of these and my mouse is a little bit more sensitive than I remembered it being. I'm Dan Brissett, the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. And welcome again to our briefing today, The Growing Climate Workforce, How Policies Today Could Shape the Jobs of Tomorrow. And it's been a while because most of us at ESI took a little bit of a break. We took advantage of the relatively quiet and relatively is the operative word here, uh, quiet time in August to take a break. It's really important to take a break now and then. Um, but then, of course, when you do, the world keeps spinning and things keep happening. And this year's been no different. And of course, we do a lot more than just briefings at EESI. And so while we took a little bit of time away from briefings, none of that other stuff really slowed down too much. Speaking of what we do, let me say a few quick words about EESI to those new to our briefings. ESI was founded in 1984 on a bipartisan basis by members of Congress to provide science-based information about environmental, energy, and climate change topics to policymakers. More recently, we've also developed a program to provide technical assistance to rural utilities interested in on-bill financing programs for their customers. EESI works hard to provide informative, objective, nonpartisan coverage of climate change topics in written materials and in so on social media. All of our educational resources, briefings like this, fact sheets, issue briefs, articles, newsletters, and podcasts are always available for free online. And we're always posting new information. Just on Friday, for example, in the lead up to today, we published a new fact sheet about climate jobs. There are 4.1 million climate jobs in the United States. In addition to coverage of the workforces that support energy efficiency, renewable energy, transmission, storage, and clean transportation, we also added a new section about climate adaptation and resilience jobs. Adaptation and resilience jobs are extremely important to track. And as climate impacts increase in frequency and severity, we predict policymakers will be more and more interested in this segment of the US climate workforce. I'd like to say many thanks to our friends at the American Society of Adaptation Professionals who helped us source this new data. And I hope you'll take a moment to download our new fact sheet and learn all about the current state of climate jobs. If you mix, missed that fact sheet, uh, well, it was just posted on Friday, so no worries about that. And to keep up with everything we do at EESI, you really absolutely must subscribe to our bi-weekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. You can do that and access all of our resources by visiting us online at www.eesi.org. And it also helps if you follow us on Twitter at EESI Online. And of course, we're also active on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Our briefing today is purposefully timed to coincide with the next phase of the debate around infrastructure and climate policy on Capitol Hill. There is a lot in play, much more than we can possibly cover during the next 90 minutes. But there's a very good chance that if you want to learn more about climate issues related to provisions up for consideration in Congress, you will find a timely and relevant resource at ESI.org of one sort or another. Of special note is the three-part briefing series we organized back in June that explored how climate investments in our energy system infrastructure would deliver multiple benefits. We also hosted a fourth briefing in June to learn more about how a national climate bank could serve as a catalyst for clean energy job creation. Again, you can watch archived webcasts of these briefings, review presentation materials, and read summary notes on our website, www.esi.org. There are many, many proposals being discussed at this very moment that would deliver emissions reductions and help our communities be more resilient to climate impacts. Our focus today is on a subset of these policies that would be very impactful in terms of growing and strengthening the climate workforce, which like I said, already employs 4.1 million people. So in just a moment, we'll be joined by five panelists who will help describe how a civilian climate core, the rural energy savings program, clean energy tax incentives, and the Clean Electricity Performance Program would create jobs and further a just and equitable transition to a decarbonized clean energy economy. The outcomes of the current infrastructure and climate policy debates in Congress are important to understand because of how multiple benefits would affect communities across the country. But what happens in the coming days and weeks will also matter a lot at a global level. We're a little bit more than one month out from the start of the 26th Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, known as COP26. Every meeting of the COP is important, but after this one was postponed last year, the urgency feels greater than ever to have a productive and constructive meeting of leaders and international climate policymakers. 
and to help Congress keep up with the negotiations and understand the implications of COP26 for the United States, we're organizing a special briefing series that starts next Friday. So I hope you'll join us next Friday, October 8th at 11.30 a.m. Eastern for Creating Policies, Coalitions, and Actions for Global Sustainable Development. You'll be treated to a conversation with Sir Robert Watson, lead author of the UN Environment Program's report, Making Peace with Nature, and former UN Framework Convention on Climate Change Executive Secretary, Christiana Figueres. You can RSVP for this and the rest of the briefing series by visiting us online at www.esi.org. And now for the panel today. As usual, we will leave a little time at the end, actually about a half an hour at the end of our session for discussion. If you have a comment, or a question, please let us know. You can send us your thoughts by email. And this is a new email address. I've been warned not to mess this up like I did my intro. You can send us an email. And the email address is ask at eesi.org. That's A-S-K at eesi.org. You can also follow us on Twitter at EESI online and send in your questions that way. We'll do our best to incorporate your input into the conversation. And now it's my privilege to introduce our first two speakers back to back. Hannah Traverse serves as the communications manager for the CORE Network and has served in communications and programming roles at the CORE Network and the National Association of Service and Conservation Corps for the past nine years. Hannah is also the lead author of the book, Join the Crew, Inspirational Stories of Young Adults in America's Service and Conservation Corps. And Hannah will be joined by Danielle Owens. Danielle serves as director of government relations at the CORE Network, where she works to develop policy initiatives with a focus on conservation, national service, and workforce development. And she has additional experience working on the Hill and in the federal government. Hannah, Danielle, welcome to our briefing today. I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. We're excited to be here. Um, as mentioned, we're from the Core Network, the National Association of Service and Conservation Corps. Uh, we're going to provide a little bit of an overview of what the current landscape is around service and conservation corps. We'll specifically look at some of the exciting work that cores are doing around workforce development and uh, climate readiness and then we'll also talk about the various proposals for a civilian climate core and what a new ccc could look like so let's see first what is a core so cores are service and workforce development programs um, they engage youth and young adults generally ages 16 to 30 and veterans up to age 35 in a term of service and that term of service could last from a few months up to a year and usually during that time core members as we call them uh, those young people are doing conservation focused projects so that could be a lot of different things it could be serving on national parks and forests maintaining trails it could be serving in in cities doing things like helping maintain urban tree canopy and uh, increasing access to healthy food through growing farms and gardens um, most cores are nonprofits. some are operated by uh, units of state and local government for example a few states like california and maine and washington operate core programs through their uh, like department of natural resources uh, cores usually do through public-private partnerships. They work with various agencies and nonprofits to come up with those projects for core members to work on. So those are through different types of partnerships, um, cooperative agreements that they do things like, as mentioned, uh, maintaining trails and campgrounds or you know, doing things to help make cities more sustainable and green. Um, so, some people might have as a reference point for the core model, the Civilian Conservation Corps, which was a program created by President Roosevelt during the Great Depression. It was a work relief program that put about 3 million young men to work uh, over a course of about eight years, I think. Um, and they accomplished a lot. They built a lot of park infrastructure that we still use today. They planted about 3 billion trees. Um, but uh, one important thing to note is that the CCC, the original Civilian Conservation Corps, was not equitable. Uh, it did practice segregation. Um, and today's cores are, are obviously quite different. So the core network, who we are, we're based in DC. We're the National Association of Service and Conservation Corps. Right now, I believe we represent 139 different organizations. They are all across the US. 
Uh, every year they engage about 20 to 25,000 young adults and post 9-11 veterans in service. And again, that age range for the participants is about 16 to 30. And uh, what we do, we help support CORES through technical assistance, uh, doing you know, advocacy on their behalf here in DC. Um, and yeah, again, they uh, all our member organizations, they are across all 50 states, DC, Puerto Rico, the young people that they engage represent a, a wide range of backgrounds. And as mentioned earlier, um, our cores are doing public-private partnerships with a range of different partners um, to do all sorts of projects across the country that are, are locally relevant. Um, so here are just some snapshot uh, outcome numbers of some of those projects. So, you know, restoring habitat, addressing invasive species, planting trees, uh, restoring waterway, um, and also there's a number up there, over 20,000 industry recognized certifications were earned by core members. So throughout their service, they, uh, those young adults, they have the opportunity to participate in job training. They can network with professionals, with the partner organizations they're serving with. They, um, they have the, the chance to gain hands-on skills through performing that service. And again, here's a, a list of some of the certifications that CORES uh, help young people earn. And they sort of fall into a few different categories. Uh, there are skills that CORE members gain in forestry and, and resource management, and tree care. There are skills that CORE members can earn in energy efficiency and home weatherization, which is something that I'll talk about in a moment. Um, and uh, another big area that I'll talk about in a moment is uh, gaining skills in wildland fire. Um, and another thing, the first bullet point there, the Public Lands Corps Hiring Authority, um, if a young person serves a minimum of 640 hours on public lands, including 120, I believe, on federal lands, they have the opportunity to earn a non-competitive hiring authority. So it gives them a pathway into a career with a, a federal agency. So with the Civilian Climate Corps, one area that we hope, um, and it makes sense to hopefully see some growth in, in terms of projects and training, um, Corps are doing some disaster response and mitigation work right now, and that includes wildland fire. Um, so Corps are doing things like maintaining stormwater infrastructure and improving that, um, stabilizing hillsides, planting native species, installing living shorelines. And then with wildland fire, there are a few stats there. Um, over the past two years, 2019, 2020, uh, over 860 core members earned red cards, which is a way that allows those young people to uh, serve on wildland fires on public lands. Uh, more than 3,300 earned chainsaw certifications, and they addressed over 32,000 acres of fire fuels. And few cores actually respond directly to fires, um, mostly the California Conservation Corps. And so, over 340 fires over that time period. Um, there are some programs, cores that are focusing on training military veterans for a transition into a civilian career in wildland fire. And then there are some cores that are also working specifically to engage more women in wildland fire as it is a field that is mostly dominated by men. Um, and just listed a couple programs there at the bottom that are doing a lot of work in this area. Um, not surprising, they are programs out west. So California Conservation Corps and then Conservation Legacy, which has several programs across the west. Um, and that's the CCC in the top photo and a picture of Conservation Legacy doing some chainsaw training in the bottom photo. And Another area that we hope to see, again, more workforce development, um, there is a new CCC coming up. Um, there are several cores in our membership that do work in energy efficiency and home weatherization. Um, so in that top photo is a picture of Civic Works. They're based in Baltimore, and they have a Center for Sustainable Careers that trains young adults in uh, different industry-recognized certifications um, around weatherization. Uh, 
same for the, the program in the lower picture there, Sustainability Institute, but these core members, they gain skills and have the opportunity to go into homeowners, uh, into low-income homes in the neighborhood, and they conduct energy efficiency audits, and then actually go in and perform different weatherization uh, things to help make those homes more uh, water and energy efficient. Um, so uh, Civic Works, the picture in the top photo, they have a solar training program. It's three months long. It is the first of its kind in Maryland. And um, again, those, those young people leave the program with the skills to hopefully go into a job in solar. And since 2009, I think that program has had a 91% uh, success rate in placing graduates in a job. And then the picture in the lower half of the screen there is Sustainability Institute. They're based in Charleston and a similar model where the young adults have the opportunity to gain skills in home weatherization and uh, they get certifications in um, HVAC, uh, OSHA 10, Building Performance Institute, Home Energy Auditor, and uh, have the chance to earn uh, earn a, a stipend, AmeriCorps award at the end of their service. And I am going to pass it over to Danielle to talk a little bit about what things look like for a Civilian Climate Corps. Yeah, um, so I'll give a brief overview of uh, where we are uh, congressionally with the Civilian Climate Corps. It's been an exciting year. Um, so far in this first session of the 117th Congress, we've had, I think it might be exactly a dozen bills introduced at this point. Uh, we had a few more introduced a couple weeks ago. Um, we started off the year on uh, January 27th with the uh, President's executive order on tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad. Um, Hannah's got this section there, it's section 215 of that executive order that called for the creation of a civilian climate core initiative. And then we led into, like I said, about a dozen uh, bills uh, that got at a civilian climate core in various different ways. Um, and now we are in the mix of the budget reconciliation process. Um, so uh, it's exciting times uh, for all of us. Um, there have been surveys that indicate that half of all voters under the age of 45 would consider joining a CCC if, uh, if and I'll say when, when it is created. Um, then recently this July, uh, there was a bicameral letter to uh, Speaker Pelosi and Leader Schumer from about 80 members and senators uh, asking for the creation of a CCC. And just two, I believe it was two weeks ago, there was a uh, letter led by uh, Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez and Congressman Magoose that had nearly 70 House members, uh, again, asking for a robustly funded CCC. And there were about 120 climate, environment, and national service organizations who also signed off on support. So we are seeing various uh, organizations and members of Congress uh, and the Senate in support of this. So it's, it's a good, good moment right now. And next, I'll kind of go over, uh, you know, the core network's vision for a CCC. Um, you know, we'd like it to be robustly funded. Um, we are looking, we think, 30 billion over the 10-year reconciliation process, uh, so 30 billion. Um, we think the CCC should start from strength and not from scratch. So as Hannah said, we have 139 uh, service and conservation corps that are out there already doing this. So, you know, we think we should start with them, let them be the backbone of the CCC. And then we need this funding for capacity building. Um, start from strength, not from scratch, and then we can expand our capacity. Um, the way we see it structured, it would be funding for project partners. So that would be the Department of Housing and Urban Development, the Department of Interior, the Forest Service through the Department of Agriculture, Department of Transportation. We also think the Department of Labor should receive funding for workforce development, and then also AmeriCorps. That will get to the national service aspects. 
We also think the CCC should focus on equity. We think there should be a priority for projects um, and enrollment from environmental justice communities. And we need those career pathways, a $15 minimum wage, and also facilitate alignment and partnerships with strategic partners. And I think that's our, our allotted time and there's our contact information. And thanks for having us, Dan. Absolutely, thank you, Danielle. And thank you, Hannah, for an excellent presentation. Um, there was a lot of good stuff in your slides. And so I just wanted to share a quick reminder that if anyone in our audience would like to go back and revisit the presentation from Hannah and Danielle, you can do that by visiting us online at www.esi.org. Everything uh, presentation-wise will be there. And if you give us a little bit of time, also some written summary notes as well, um, as well as the archived webcast. So thank you very much. Um, our, I guess, third speaker, our second topic, uh, is going to be delivered by Kate Latour. Kate is the Director of Government Relations at the National Cooperative Business Association, CLUSA International. In this role, Kate leads the advocacy efforts of NCBA CLUSA to elevate the profile of the cooperative business model across all sectors of the economy and urge policymakers to center co-ops as a policy solution to evolving social and economic challenges, including both domestic and international development, Kate, it is always so nice to see you. I'm really looking forward to your presentation today about the Rural Energy Savings Program. Thank you so much, Dan, and thank you for having me. It is, again, always a pleasure to be with you. Um, I will start with just a little bit of background um, on who we are, um, the National Cooperative Business Association. We are the apex association for all types of co-ops, um, so across the sector. So I listed a few here um, that folks may be familiar with. Um, we'll be giving special emphasis today to our electric co-op sector um, as they are a, a big implementer of the Rural Energy Savings Program. Um, but just wanted to get folks thinking about, um, particularly in the job space, the many ways in which cooperatives across the sector really invest in local development um, and can really build these more resilient economies. Um, I think what's really important in this conversation too is that the local ownership of, of co-ops, you know, one member, one vote, also naturally makes them more invested in the long-term well-being of both its members and communities which they serve. Um, fundamentally, co-ops are about the people, not the profits, um, and that certainly manifests in a real resistance to short-termism um, and, and look towards uh, the long-term goals. Uh, next slide, please. So again, just to kind of provide the lay of the land, one in three Americans is a member of at least one co-op. So um, many folks, if they're mutual insurance or they're a member of a credit union, they're served by an electric co-op, uh, are probably members of multiple uh, cooperatives. So um, across the United States, it accounts for 65,000 businesses. And most often they are formed to meet a community need or fix a market failure. And the electric co-ops, I think, are really um, perfect case for that uh, reasoning um, and have been a really critical tool for wealth building in rural America. Um, with the Rural Electrification Administration um, and the foundation of electric co-ops, uh, cooperatives, which you know, really were born out of the, the skills and expertise of farmers in America, um, brought electricity to households in really remarkable time. In less than a generation, rural 10% of rural households had electricity and you know, within just a couple decades, um, over 90% of households in rural America had access to reliable and affordable electricity. What I think is particularly um, noteworthy is that this was, of course, after uh, investor-owned utility companies really declined to pursue um, these investments in rural America, despite incentives from the federal government. Um, and so rural Americans really said, you know, we could take it on ourselves um, and, and build these lasting models. Um, today, there are more than 900 co-ops that handle generation and transmission, as well as the distribution of electricity um, to rural households and businesses. Um, they account for 42% of all of uh, the electric lines in the United States um, and actually uh, serve over nearly 60% of the U.S. land mass. Um, and I think the fundamental access to service that helped ensure that rural homes and small businesses could access some of the same op economic opportunity 
as other communities across the country is really um, continuing to play out today as many electric co-ops are also implementing broadband um, where you know making sure that educational and equal economic opportunity isn't really defined by where you live. Um, and if it's like most of the other conversations uh, I've had recently, I'm sure broadband will come up more extensively in a bit. Um, so next slide, please. Um, just to, again, kind of give a little bit of perspective of the landmass on the left that electric co-ops serve. Um, it also, uh, electric co-ops serve over 90% of persistent poverty counties in the, in the United States. So I think, um, you know, as we're talking about uh, investments in, in clean energy, uh, making sure that those opportunities are afforded to all Americans and really re remove the barriers um, to participation. Uh, we know that they are rural communities in general um, are energy burdened. They face higher bills than other communities. Um, and the average, uh, you know, like I said, those average utility bills far outpace um, non-rural communities across the 200, 2,500 uh, counties that electric co-ops serve. Um, it, I think the exact number is between 92 and 93% of um, persistent poverty counties. So there are really um, compounding factors at play then. The, the lower quality housing stock then leads to higher energy usage. Um, and like I said, those higher energy bills. Um, they are also very unlikely subsequently to have the financial resources to make any upfront expenditures for home improvements that are geared toward uh, energy efficiency. Um, so with that, I'll cue the next slide and uh, in comes the Rural Energy Savings Program. This uh, started out as a pilot program in 2010, uh, had bipartisan support in Congress um, and was made permanent and then most recently reauthorized in the 2018 Farm Bill. Um, it has gone through some changes throughout, but really at its core has maintained um, a 20 year loan for 0% interest. Um, electric co-ops, like I said, are one of the implementers, though over the years that has expanded to some other entities as well um, to make it more participatory. Um, and then the, you know, in the case of the electric co-ops, they act as a sort of intermediary, ultimately to implement, um, take the loan from USDA uh, and implement those energy efficiency improvements onto individual households and small businesses. Um, and, and Dan touched on it earlier, but really they've been doing such wonderful work at EESI on on-bill financing um, and helping electric co-ops set up those programs so that um, for either zero or very low upfront costs to consumers, uh, those households then pay back the loan, the cost of what it took to implement energy efficiency um, measures onto their home is repaid through their monthly utility bills. Uh, the repayment to the co-op has, you know, safeguards in place um, so that it is only used for covering the costs of the program um, and then towards uh, some limited costs towards uh, loan loss reserves. Um, rural energy savings program loans can be used for an enormously wide variety of activities around uh, lighting, heating and air conditioning, windows, water heaters, the list goes on. Um, and, and really both improving and replacing um, some of these really critical aspects of homes. The um, improvements are, are almost realized immediately by the consumer, really. Um, so even though they're repaying the energy efficiency loan on their bill, their monthly costs are often reduced by so much that still uh, their, their monthly bills are much, much lower. Um, the USDA estimates about 25% of savings monthly to the consumer, um, but in reality, that translates to hundreds of dollars um, in some cases for, for homes that really need it. Uh, so that is, you know, more dollars in the pockets of everyday people um, and hopefully more to kind of spend and recirculate through your local community. Um, the uptake of this program by co-ops and other implementers um, has been big and it's also growing, which I think is really exciting. Um, in the last four years, RESP has uh, obligated over 180 million um, in loans to electric co-ops and the most uh, funded states through this program are Arkansas, Texas, and Colorado. Um, the improvement on the individual home costs anywhere between around $1,500 to $7,000. Um, and so again, thinking about those communities that electric co-ops are serving, that's a cost that would really otherwise be out of reach 
for most people if, um, if the electric co-op didn't act as that intermediary. And then just to be really specific about the jobs component, since that's why we're here today, um, without removing that barrier to participation, these services wouldn't be needed in many cases. Um, since REST covers those upfront costs for households, electric co-ops are able to um, either build in-house expertise and have that good paying quality job within the co-op, um, or are able to contract with a company, which most often is a, is a local small business in their community. Um, and then taking one step back of how we get there is the, the jobs around manufacturing and construction to meet increased demand um, for these products uh, that people are using. Um, a quick kind of appropriations history, the, um, which is, is really exciting the, in the president's budget this year, as well as in um, the appropriations bill, the committee's recommended increases to the program um, because of the success of the program and the uh, never having missed a payment by a borrower in this program, OMB actually downgraded the risk, um, which improved the uh, subsidy rate. And so with, you know, really somewhat small appropriations um, have leveraged a really high dollar amount to be able to lend. Um, so with um, about 22 million in budget authority could actually uh, lend up to $400 million um, out to these co-ops to make these improvements. Um, next slide, please. So there's also really exciting movement um, within the Build Back Better Act uh, that the House Committee had, the House Agriculture Committee included, um, that goes even further to advance kind of the equitable participation and benefits of the program. Ultimately, it included $200 million um, that would supplement the usual appropriations. Um, and expanding on the loans of this program, uh, the Build Back Better Act actually included a grants component um, that would, uh, for persistent poverty counties, um, would be up to 10%, and in other counties would be up to 5% of the loan amount. Um, and it, importantly, for the electric co-ops, one of the eligible uses is for administration of the loan and grant. Although they serve these vast distances, Many electric co-ops have a very few number of employees. Um, so, you know, and, and most of those are, are line workers and folks in the field, very few in-house in the office. Um, so really important to have that support there. And then also um, for the repairs and contracts to really bring um, the uh, very low quality homes up to, you know, kind of par so that they become eligible for the energy efficiency improvements. Um, and again, you know, thinking about this is this is a, a high, a relatively high number of homes um, that who are now able to participate in the program, um, where otherwise it may be out of reach for for various reasons. Um, and then, as I wrap up, just next slide, please. Um, just one plug for uh, kind of the cooperative business model. Um, co-ops, one of their unique features is they work on um, seven cooperative principles and principle six here is cooperation among cooperatives. And this is just a very top layer because I think there's, there's a great deal more here, but um, three sectors of cooperative community where I think uh, there's particularly ripe opportunity for coordination and collaboration um, and really have a, a multiplier of good benefits um, working together across sectors where we're kind of doubling down on local ownership. The first is worker cooperatives. Um, most fundamentally, for a jobs perspective, there is um, there's a rise in the number of worker co-ops across the country right now, which is really exciting. Um, and these are businesses, of course, that are owned and governed by the employees. Many of them in the energy space right now um, happen to be solar, but there is certainly nothing preventing um, other types of businesses becoming worker owned. Um, and I will say to kind of supplement this, um, there is another provision in the small business section of the Build Back Better Act that would provide a co-op lending pilot program out of the Small Business Administration, which could really um, do a number towards unlocking access to capital. Uh, the second is housing cooperatives. Um, at last measure, about 15% of housing stock in electric co-op service territory is manufactured housing. Um, and that's compared to about six and a half percent as the national average um, res uh, manufactured housing is the only form of non-subsidized affordable housing, um, but in many cases, the uh, land underneath is not owned by the people who live there. So 
uh, there is a rise in the number of resident owned communities for the folks in the manufactured housing community uh, come together and purchase the land, um, which uh, not only takes away the predatory aspect of land fees, but also um, gives them as more uh, wealth creation opportunity um, and generally kind of quality of life. It improves the upkeep of the communities. Um, and then lastly is the food and grocery cooperatives. Um, there is a pretty thin margin for profits in grocery um, and it's particularly challenging accessing rural fresh food in rural communities um, in part because many of the mom and pop kind of grocery stores corner stores um, there is no immediate buyer and so many are saying we're ready to retire we're going to close our doors um, and so having consumer owned food co-ops um, is a really great way to maintain the access they have uh, higher job creation rates than traditional grocery stores, higher reinvestment in the communities, and higher percentages of local sourcing of food than, again, kind of the traditional grocery stores. Um, and I think these rural energy partnerships are a good opportunity to, um, you know, make sure that the refrigeration and the lighting and the HVAC at the uh, food co-op is, you know, as efficient and affordable as possible um, to make sure that, again, those assets are really building in the community. Ultimately, I think these these sectors and others um, really add up collectively and affords people a higher quality of life in rural communities, um, really ensuring that there is, from the basic, access to a safe home and access to fresh, healthy foods, making sure that there is you know, a workforce to match the companies in their community um, and keeping costs of you know, having more people in the service area uh, can help spread across, spread costs across the homes, across the service area. Um, and again, ultimately um, creating this, generating this higher quality of life um, for more people and making it more accessible to more people. Um, so I think I will stop there and turn it back to Dan. Awesome, Kate. Thank you so much for your great presentation. Um, Kate brought up lots of great points. Uh, so did Hannah and so did Danielle and so are our next two speakers. Folks in our audience have the opportunity to ask them questions and you can do that in two ways. One is you can follow us on Twitter at EESI online and submit your question that way. And you can also send us an email and the email address is ask, A-S-K, at EESI.org. So feel free to ask questions and we'll do our best to incorporate them into our moderated discussion that will start in just a moment. Um, our next panelist is Uday Veradarajan. He is a principal at RMI, which is formerly uh, Rocky Mountain Institute. He focuses on how to use cutting edge data and financial policy and regulatory analysis to help drive a just transition to clean energy. Welcome to the briefing today. I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Well, thank you so much again, Dan. Uh, and uh, thanks again for the opportunity to chat about uh, federal tax incentives in particular. And I I'm gonna uh, really focus a little bit at some of the uh, maybe 30,000 foot level issues uh, associated with uh, uh, the federal tax incentives in particular uh, for clean energy that are in place today and talk a little bit about um, what it is about those incentives as they're currently constructed that do and do not work in terms of addressing uh, the urgency of the need for climate action and in particular doing so in a way that ensures that the costs of that climate action are not on those least able to bear, that energy consumers and communities uh, are, are not the ones bearing that risk. Um, and I'll then turn to talk a little bit uh, very briefly about the specific proposals that are being considered uh, as part of the Build Better Act uh, and uh, to address them both in the House and in uh, previous Senate legislation as well. So first, I just want to get at the high picture, uh, the very big picture, which is, at the end of the day, rapid climate action uh, is going to require a pretty significant transition of very large energy intensive sectors of our economy in a very rapid fashion, particularly to 2030. If, we're happy, if we actually are, built, are going to make a difference on climate, we've got to move fast. And in particular, that means moving fast uh, well before assets, uh, communities, uh, and many workers would have otherwise been ready to move to a different industry. And this, in, in particular, 
is a challenge for customers and communities. Investors very often are protected themselves, but customers and communities are often not very well protected. And the reason for this is really imperfect competition throughout our economies, where investors have basically given themselves contracts or have regulatory protections that keep them from bearing the costs of moving rapidly, while consumers uh, and communities often have no such protections. And so there is a real risk here that consumers and communities might bear the cost of climate action. So this is why fundamentally we need to have climate action uh, and climate policy focus on equity. And that means figuring out ways to protect energy customers and communities. So why is this uh, so important? Well, the problem is that if you don't have policy intervention, climate action has the risk of being basically doubly regressive. It, these lower income states right now across the country that have far more communities that face employment or economic risk from climate action. And it's low income households that disproportionately might bear the burden from energy usage. And I've got a chart here that kind of shows the energy burden by income percentile. And what you see is that uh, not, su not surprisingly, energy burden is very, very substantial for those in the lowest income percentiles as a fraction of their uh, uh, income uh, writ large. And there is real risk that climate action could fall on these communities, especially ones with undiversified fossil dependent economies. And public policy really needs to work hard to protect these customers and workers. Now, the other uh, 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 line on the left that you see in this slide shows the federal tax burden. And what's fascinating is for most people, energy matters more than tax burden, at least uh, when we exclude payroll taxes, which are regressive in the same way that energy burden is. And for most people, this is uh, a significant issue. And it motivates why in federal uh, financing in particular can play such an important role here. Effectively, federal financing uh, as a source of funding to enable transition can help mitigate energy burden. We shouldn't be leaving these uh, energy burdens to customers. Otherwise, we end up really risking having a regressive outcome. And federal financing can really help as well positioned to make sure that if we act on climate, it's not those who are most vulnerable who end up paying for it. Uh, indeed, this is particularly true for communities. And we, uh, we see the reality uh, of this in the way that over the last decade and a half, utilities have actually shifted uh, in response to already changing economic circumstances in clean energy relative to dirty energy. And what you've seen here, what you see in this graph to the left is how utilities have invested in coal plants in particular, in steam and uh, fossil plants in general, but in particular coal plants. And what you see is the big red bars are how much they've invested in coal plants over the last decade and a half. And what you see in the dark uh, and gray lines is employment. Uh, numbers in those uh, areas. And what you see is investors have invested more and more money and are making more and more earnings on coal and steam plants while there are fewer and fewer people employed uh, at these uh, plants. And this is a risk that we face fundamentally that falls on communities in particular and on workforce. That in the absence of action, there is a significant negative risk for employment in these communities. Uh, with uh, continued investment in the existing coal assets still being possible. And then not only that, those costs associated with the increasing investment in coal plants that we've actually seen over the last decade all fall on these same uh, on customers in those same communities. And this brings me back, why am I talking about these costs? It's because this is what motivates a significant fraction of the public policy response in the Build Back Better Act to how to address climate change in an equitable uh, way. And it's about using tax incentives uh, and programs like the CEPP to make sure that this story is reversed, that these communities are invested in, that low-income uh, consumers of energy are not the ones bearing this burden. And it is possible with some reforms. But let me just motivate very quickly what those reforms are. First of all, let's talk about where these risks are the biggest. They're uh, probably concentrated heavily in coal-heavy southeastern and midwestern utilities. That's where most of the existing coal and other fossil generation are. And let me talk a little bit about health burden here as well, because not only are there cost burdens uh, from the emissions 
uh, that affect or from associated with existing coal plants that affect vulnerable communities. But let's not forget the enormous burden of uh, mortality and morbidity risks associated with the actual uh, pollute, pollution uh, from these plants, which are particularly borne uh, by BIPOC and low income communities as well as by uh, the elder. Uh, all of this seem, uh, suggests that there are significant costs from the existing system uh, that are really already putting a burden on many communities that uh, if we were to ask them to bear the costs of transition, uh, would make that transition very challenging. The reason we're optimistic is because in the long run, the cost of reducing emissions in the US sec electricity sector has dramatically improved over the last 15 years with, uh, with costs for, for example, solar, wind, as well as in batteries coming down significantly uh, since uh, 2005. Uh, however, those costs often do include at least current solar and wind federal tax incentives. So they're an important part of the economics that makes this work. That being said, uh, there are several features that I want to kind of motivate about the current tax incentive system that make them unsuited to appropriately mitigate the burden on vulnerable communities, particularly the rate burden, but also the burden faced by energy communities. And let me start with one uh, a fact that I think is very, uh, is not widely recognized as well as it should be, which is under current tax law, these tax incentives that have played an important role, the production tax credit and the investment tax credit, as well as uh, incentives uh, known as 45Q tax credit for carbon sequestration. These incentives that the federal governments provide are actually not efficiently usable by the utilities that own the majority, vast majority, 80% of the remaining coal on the system. Those utilities actually don't have tax liabilities or have very little in uh, tax liabilities coming in the next few years to actually use any of those tax incentives and efficiently pass them through to their customers to reduce the costs uh, of replacing their existing coal plants with clean energy options. In fact, those utilities together across the country have enough tax liability to basically transition and mitigate the emissions and costs uh, associated with about one to two coal plants being uh, a worth of generation being replaced. Uh, and there are two kind of technical reasons with, that I'm not going to go into, but that are part of what we need to address in order to uh, mitigate this, which is that effectively, most of the country's utilities really couldn't use these tax incentives themselves to begin with under current law. Secondly, as it turns out, current tax law only focuses on a couple of clean technologies but often not on many complementary and emerging technologies as easily that might be needed to address not just the energy needs, but also some technical grid flexibility needs. For instance, during very cold winter spells in, uh, in certain parts of the country, it's rather difficult to rely on solar and wind alone. Uh, and efficiency, uh, as well as other technologies like hydrogen and uh, carbon sequestration and storage, as well as nuclear, can really help address those uh, difficulties. But you need the right incentives that are technology that, are, that give flexibility uh, to address the, the needs in ways that work uh, for the grids uh, of uh, local uh, in, in various areas. So while climate action looks economic in the long run with current policy, but there are near-term energy cost burdens, issues associated with uh, weather risk, and certain fossil community job losses and challenges that are likely inadequately addressed, particularly in uh, uh, utilities that can't use the existing tax incentives. And, uh, some example here that I'm not going to talk a whole lot about, but you can take a look at later, looks at an existing coal plant and asks, well, what if you did take an existing coal plant in the middle of the country that's kind of representative, replace it with wind and solar with current policies alone? And indeed, there is a good tax incentive, and in the long run, that replacement looks very attractive. Uh, solar and wind really look like they're economic to replace, for example, many existing coal plants. But if you do the math on how it would, what, what the customer cost today would be, and how much of those benefits go to local communities uh, near the plant and mine versus uh, being uh, uh, providing economic benefits in other communities that may not be local, the picture isn't as rosy. And those incentives aren't working as well as we'd like in focusing benefits on the communities that might be harmed 
uh, and in reducing customer costs today. And we, as we saw in the previous slide about Energy Britain, that really matters for customers and isn't an equitable outcome. So what can you do? Well, it turns out that the current package of policies being proposed in the Build Back Better Act uh, uh, particularly changes to the existing tax credits are significantly aligned with mitigating many of the challenges that I've just mentioned. And particularly when complemented by a couple of other programs I'd call out, one uh, is gonna be the, the focus of the next uh, discussion, the CEPP, and the second, uh, something I can talk about further, uh, DOE loans, can really help to address many of these issues. Um, and let me just talk very briefly about exactly what those changes are that are in proposed in uh, both House and Senate versions, we hope in the Senate versions, but in Senate versions of previous bills. One uh, is it turns out that many of the reasons that utilities cannot use or do not use existing tax benefits can be mitigated with two big changes. Uh, one is to allow the solar, uh, uh, for solar installations to use the production tax credit, which is a lot better suited for utility, uh, 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 for, to allow utilities to make use of tax incentives than the current investment tax credit. And there's another technical issue called tax normalization that actually forces uh, investor-owned utilities to keep more uh, to keep some of the benefits of the tax credit to increase their returns rather than pass that through to their customers. Fixing those can really make solar uh, and other advanced technologies more attractive for utilities and their customers. Secondly, it turns out we need to fix this issue of not allowing co-ops, munis, and regulated utilities to uh, not be able to use these tax credits. And there's a, a, a provision called direct pay that allows, uh, essentially uh, allows these utilities to utilize them regardless of existing and current tax status and pass as long as they pass that benefit through to their customers and obey a couple of other basic public good provisions. Third, we need to make sure that all of the complementary technologies that might make sense for a local community that can work perhaps to address both environmental and economic impact on local communities are in play. So making the production tax credit with these other modifications uh, and the 45Q uh, tax credit for carbon sequestration available uh, to all clean generation technologies uh, with direct pay for the 45Q uh, can go a long way towards uh, making leveling the playing field to make attractive options that work locally uh, to be available. And finally, we need to uh, make sure that these incentives incentivize the broadest range uh, of potential options, the ones that might be the lowest cost in the long run and that mitigate the greatest risk that customers and communities face. And this includes demand side resources and resources that are uh, about making our grid more resilient uh, in the future, storage, transmission. Uh, uh, and uh, indeed, there are uh, several different uh, provisions in existing uh, in the House bill as well as coming uh, in the Senate bill, opportunities as well moving forward to add this flexibility to our tax incentives to make them uh, better suited for mitigating the real burdens that customers face and to set up what uh, uh, Yvonne will talk about next, which is an enormous jobs opportunity in replacing these resources with clean energy, uh, uh, cleaner energy options and investing in mitigation uh, of carbon across the country. And finally, I just wanted to end with an example of how some of these uh, provisions, and in particular, I didn't talk very much about a DOE loan. But this is also another important part of the policy, how they can work together to take, uh, uh, to, in principle, make the transition from a solution to climate being not necessarily cost effective to one that actually can work and lead to an equitable outcome. And I'll take the example of carbon capture and storage at an existing coal plant. Right now, it would, uh, it would be more costly than continuing to run uh, an existing coal plant, perhaps significantly so. But if the 45Q tax credit can be made direct pay, you can significantly reduce that delta. And moreover, if there are DOE loans available to address some of the risks and mitigate those costs further, particularly associated with existing investments that were made in pollution control equipment at many of the exist you know, existing coal plants, the net result can be that a transition of an existing plant to uh, perhaps uh, use uh, uh, another fuel and or 
to uh, capture and store the carbon for any carbon containing fuels that it uh, continues to burn can become significantly more cost effective uh, uh, in balance. And this is where kind of combining uh, uh, several different mechanisms can play a significant role in mitigating uh, the challenges that we face in achieving an equitable outcome while still addressing the urgent needs of climate on a forward-looking basis. Uh, well, again, thanks so much for the opportunity to talk about it, and that's all I've got. Well, thank you so much, um, Uday, for that. That was excellent, and you've made it sound like that wasn't a ton. That was an amazing uh, presentation, uh, and just as a reminder, um, Uday's presentation, his slides, materials, as well as notes will be available on our website at www.esi.org. Um, a lot of where you just left off leads us directly into our next panelist. Uh, and so it's my privilege to introduce Yvonne McIntyre. She is the Natural Resources Defense Council's Director of Federal Electricity and Utility Policy. In this role, she's responsible for the development and advocacy of NRDC's federal power sector uh, climate change, clean air, and clean energy policies. Avon is a seasoned government affairs professional with a longtime career advocating for federal power sector policies before Congress, the administration, and regulatory agencies. And now it is our pleasure to listen to what you have to say about the Clean Electricity Performance Program. Take it away, Avon. Thanks, Dan. And okay, I think. Everybody should be able to see my my um, <laughs> my slides here. I'm not quite used to doing this, so thank you for um, giving me the opportunity to come and, and present today on the Clean Electricity Performance Program. So I'm going to go through a little bit about what exactly is it, um, and then talk about um, you know some of the, the jobs and economic impacts that we have um, uh, analyzed, had analyzed, um, and with a report that was released a couple of weeks ago. Okay, so what is the Clean Electricity Performance Program, the CEPP? Um, so the CEPP is, you know, basically modeled on, you know, trying to mimic the, the results of what a clean electricity standard could, could get you. So, you know, what is it, um, what kind of proposal that you can craft to fit within the reconciliation kind of parameters um, that will drive um, drastic transition in the, the power sector to, um, to more clean electricity um, portfolios. And so it is a federal investment program supporting steady growth in carbon free energy over the coming decade. And it uses federal financial incentives um, to encourage suppliers of retail electricity to increase their share of electricity, clean electricity, from a certain baseline. Um, and uh, so increasing 4.5 four percentage points per year, um, starting in 2023 and running through 2030. And again, th this is all um, a proposal that is in the House Energy and Commerce Committee's reconciliation package. So suppliers that actually meet or exceed the 4% per year receive a grant from the Department of Energy um, that is to be used to protect electric electricity customers and offset the cost of increasing um, the clean electricity supply. And suppliers that fall short um, have to make a payment for each megawatt hour that they're short below the four, per, four percentage points. Um, there is a there's formulas um, that that you know determine the amount of grant each um, each supplier gets or the the payment that they they have to um, give. And um, so, if the um, supplier increases by you know four percentage points or more um, the the grant determination is it's 150 dollars um, uh, times the the percent the megawatt hours increases um, uh, for that year but they actually don't pay it on the full four percent increase they pay it on um, the increase above 1.5 percent um, and so again it's 150 um, times a percentage increase, the minus 1.5%. The payments, again, if you don't reach that 4%, it's $40 times the, um, the, the amount that you came in under the 4%. So 
And what qualifies as clean? Um, so the definition of clean in the proposal is a carbon intensity of 0.1 tons of carbon uh, dioxide equivalent per megawatt hour. So that includes all um, zero emissions or very low emissions resources. Um, so, you know, all renewables, nuclear, um, hydropower, uh, and, and coal and new, uh, excuse me, coal and gas with, with combined uh, carbon capture and storage. The baseline is established um, starting in uh, 2023. It's the average of, of um, a supplier's clean electricity portfolio um, over uh, the years 2019 and 2020. Um, and you know, there, there's always discussions in any type of climate, uh, power sector climate program of you know, how do you make it fair to um, the good actors, the, the ones that are very clean already. So. Any supplier that has uh, 85 that is 85 percent clean um, will not have to make any payments if they don't increase um, four percent a year, but they will continue to get a payment if they actually meet that four percent increase. And so it it um, it again recognizes um, the good actors, but also encourages them to keep keep going. And then there's also some flexibility and allowing. Uh, resale suppliers to defer um, their their um, payments uh, by two two to three year increments. So if if a supplier says, okay, I'm not going to be able to meet that four percent this year, but I know in the next year I'm going to be able to 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 make that plus some because I have a big um, clean electricity resource that's coming on, or you know I know I'm about to sign a, a power purchase agreement to bring it on. They can defer, um, but that as long as they uh, make up for not just what they were below um, in the year that they defer, but you know also adding on four percent on top of that. This goes back to a lot of what um, Uday was saying. Um, you know, the whole point of of this program is to again encourage a rapid transition to um, cleaner electricity, but at the same time, you know lessening the, 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 the cost um, that ratepayers um, and communities are going to have to, um, to bear uh, uh, with this transition. And so because it is a, um, a federal incentive, that means that rather than you know, passing through the cost of, of transforming um, uh, the portfolio to, to greater clean electricity resources, um, this directs that the, the grant, the payment that the re retail suppliers receive has to be used exclusively for the benefit of customers. And so this could be, you know, helping reduce customer bills, um, investing in building or, you know, a new clean electricity resource or, you know, entering into a contract to purchase um, power from a new clean electricity resource, um, worker retention uh, programs, worker transition programs, um, and so these are all um, ways that um, this proposal is structured to again reduce the the impact on ratepayers as well as on you know the, the the impact on the transition on workers and, and communities. So about two weeks ago, September 9th, um, the analysis group um, released a report on the economic and jobs impacts of implementing a Clean Electricity Performance Program. Um, this report was commissioned by uh, NRDC and Evergreen Action. And um, so what they determined, what they found was that a CEPP that, is, that drives to 80% clean by 2030, which is the goal of you know, the, the, the House proposal and um, one of President Biden's goals, stated goals for the power sector, would expand the workforce by nearly 8 million jobs over the next decade, um, grow the economy by nearly $1 trillion, job, as trillion dollars, um, increase federal, state, and local revenues by $154 billion, um, and then drive you know, massive new economic development through the construction of new renewable and clean energy resources, um, 600 gig gigawatts of new solar, wind, and other clean energy projects. A um, little bit about background on how this study was done. Um, they used a macroeconomic model that um, reviewed the level of investment and changes in power system operations associated with implementing a national CEPP over the 10-year period. 
um, and again, kind of evaluating investments in an operation of eligible low, low carbon and zero carbon resources. Um, this did not model exactly what the, um, what, what's in the House Energy and Commerce Committee proposal because this came out before we knew what the specifics of, of the text of the legislation would be. Um, but it does reflect, um, it, it's pretty close to um, what, what, the, what the legislative proposal came out to be. Um, and so we, we think that this still is a very good approximation of what the impacts will be um, if something like the House um, package goes forward. Um, the other thing that it does include um, is uh, like related to tax credit um, that there's a 10 year um, extension of all the clean energy tax credits um, and um, that there are basically it's business as usual as far as any new um, state or local um, policies, clean climate and clean energy policies. So breaking down um, the jobs impact, so it's actually 7.7 .7 million net new jobs. Um, net obviously means that as you're increasing um, your clean electricity resources deployment, um, that means fossil fuel um, will come offline or decrease in operations. And so it is taken into account um, how many new jobs will be added um, in the clean electricity sector, but you know, minus the, the impacts on the fossil fuel sector. Um, so 125 new jobs in the early years of the program, growing to 1.7 billion uh, million jobs each year, um, starting in 2030. Um, and of course, this means all kinds of jobs in you know the, the clean electricity sector, so electrical workers, solar installers, wind technicians, um, and all the other types of man, uh, construction jobs that that come with that. Um, not going to like go into everything, but the other thing is. Because this proposal would be impacting every single retail electricity supplier across the country, um, you would see massive changes in the clean electricity deployment across the country. And so these jobs would be coming into um, every state across the nation. Um, Again, some of the other uh, details of this uh, benefits arise from, again, direct investment and operation of the resources, as well as all the other um, kind of um, related jobs that come along with, with um, you know, bringing on new, new clean electricity resources in the community. Um, again, as I said, it's, it's across the US. Um, and so it would not only drive, um, you know, greater jobs in, in, in building, these electricity resources, new electricity resources across this country, but the supply chain um, as well. And so, you know, we are looking at a rapid kind of deployment of new technologies over the next 10 years. So that, you know, will also hopefully force, um, you know, more uh, development manufacturing of the components needed to get these resources online. Um, I know, um, but I touched on this, um, but you know, the, the we believe that you know, obviously, the taxing tax incentives and the CEPP um, complement each other, and really both are are very instrumental in getting us to the twenty uh, excuse me eighty percent by twenty thirty goals um, for the power sector. Um, you know, already um, did the CEPP just the way that it's designed will again relieve some of the burden um, uh, on the ratepayers, but having the tax incentives also in place helps reduce the cost of new electricity resources from coming online. And so, you know, working in tandem, it will help reduce the cost of this clean electricity transition. Um, and uh, you know, again, at the same time, growing jobs um, across the country. And so. You know, we just think that these are two very um, key components um, that will be um, instrumental in, in getting us to our climate and clean energy goals. And so as this process moves through um, the um, through Congress, you know, we, we really hope to retain you know, some of the strong um, provisions that are in the House, both for the CEPP and the, the tax credits. With that, um, and there will be, um, I know I provided links or copies of the, the, um, the analysis group jobs and economic impact report. And so, you know, you'll be able to get those um, on EESI's, EESI's website. 
Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Yvonne, for a great presentation. And yes, for sure, um, everything will be available um, on the um, briefing webpage. And if you've RSVP'd, um, that's a great way to ensure that you get all the follow-up materials. Um, we are gonna transition now to questions for the next 20-ish minutes. Um, and to do that, um, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Amber Taroff. Um, she will lead our Q&A today. Um, Amber is on our policy team. She's a senior associate and has worked hard um, along with our colleagues on the policy team and on our communications team to bring this briefing to everyone today. So Amber, why don't I turn it over to you to lead our Q&A? Thanks a lot, Dan, and thanks to our panelists today. Uh, so first question, many of these policies already exist in some form. Uh, there are already core across the country, improving our environment, clean energy tax credits, and RESP have helped accelerate uh, clean energy ad um, adoption, and many states have their own version of a clean electricity standard. So how could additional investments, such as those proposed in the reconciliation, uh, build on existing efforts at the state and local level? Um, and let's start uh, with the original lineup. So Danielle, um, how about you go first? Sure, thank you. Um, I think the additional funding um, down to the state and local level could help with uh, capacity building. Um, could also, you know, from the core perspective, you know, help uh, build more career pathways for core members. And also for the cores, it could help them to be able to engage more youth in the core movement. Thanks, Kate. Yeah, I will echo capacity building. I think that's going to be um, hugely important. Um, I also think um, just really building on existing efforts around making these programs more accessible. So um, in thinking about the 200 million in the Build Back Better Act, um, that it's really helping that, that lowest tier of housing stock get up to the grade it needs to be to be eligible. So um, I think those kind of compounding efforts will be really helpful. Um, Uday? Yeah, I think, um, again, the um, state and local officials are the ones ultimately, particularly regulators who and those who oversee municipal utilities and those who are working on co-ops are the ones who face the uh, unenviable task of being the intermediaries who are responsible for figuring out how we execute on the transition of our economy in ways that still keep rates affordable. And these are the, particularly the tax incentives if they're made direct pay and CEPP are gonna be critical tools for those folks to give them the support that they need to basically make sure that we've got their back so that they can make this happen in ways that bring the benefits of clean energy and the jobs to their communities. And yes, there are a number of states that have um, RPS or CES type um, policies and programs in place. Um, and, you know, I, none of them, well, I know that there have been some that have been changing them of late, but none of them had, had been taking us out to the 2030, 2035 um, timelines. And the other thing is it's not across the entire country, right? Not every state has an RPS and R RES. And so this will be a national program um, that would drive every state to, you know, move into a clean electricity um, uh, path and at a quicker transition than what, what's currently um, existing. And, you know, I, I worked in the power sector for 30 years before moving over to NRDC. Um, and I am heartened by the fact that, you know, a lot of utilities have been making pretty, you know, substantial goals and commitments. Um, but the fact of the matter is you can say, you know, you can make these commitments, but don't have to move forward and actually achieve them. And so providing this financial incentive, um, you know, they're going to get money to help with this transition, to help with, you know, making the argument to their public service commissions to say, you know, I have this, this you know, commitment, this goal that I have, I'm going to get some money from the federal government to help take us there um, and, and, you know, reduce the impact on consumers. And so, you know, this will be something that's nationwide and, and take us there more quickly and at a less cost. Thank you all. Um, our second question is, how could investment into these programs contribute overall to improved energy af affordability or other climate justice goals? And let's start again with Danielle. Sorry. Um, sure. So, you know, that one of our goals with the CCC 
is for uh, those frontline communities, the environmental justice communities to, uh, we would like to see a commitment to a, a, a large percentage of them being the ones that are getting the project work, that are getting the funding, those communities. And I don't know if you have anything. Yeah, I think like you touched on also earlier, um, I mean, the main way to promote climate justice is creating these job opportunities in communities where there is work to do to fix past climate injustices. So, I mean, there's just so much impact that can happen when you're empowering young adults with the knowledge and the skills and the recognition that they can make a difference in their communities and, and do this work. Um, and, and as mentioned, there are already a lot of cores doing the work um, in communities right now, uh, you know, training young people to go in and, and weatherize homes and uh, make our housing stock more sustainable. Thank you both. Um, over to Kate. Sure, yeah, I think maybe um, tangentially to in, in addition to the um, kind of provisions from the Rural Energy Savings Program, um, I also think a, a provision that will kind of help move the needle here is the Rural Partnership Program. Um, really flexible dollars proposed um, out of the Build Back Better Act that would um, help local governments partner with nonprofits, for profits, and other entities, um, both to build capacity as well as carry out these projects. Um, so I think you know you can see how they would um, overlap with these various efforts, and I think allow you know local, states, regional. Um, either government or quasi-government entities kind of take a little bit more holistic approach. And um, again, whether that is advancing um, energy affordability, affordability specifically through RESP or taking it maybe a step back and looking at um, kind of housing a little bit more broadly or small business a little bit more broadly. So I think it provides that flexibility. Thanks. Ude? Yeah, I, I think um, the connection is perhaps most clear with the tax incentives and CPP on this. Uh, ultimately, uh, you know, it's that uh, it's that graph uh, that I'm trying to show around energy burden versus tax burden, and it's just uh, these programs are fundamentally about making sure that we're not financing global action on climate and national action on climate on the backs of those who are least able to do it. They are fundamentally designed to make sure that the financing is coming from those who can afford it today to make sure those who can't afford it uh, are not uh, uh, are actually uh, having a chance to contribute by instead having the jobs and lower energy costs that allow them to grow their local economies uh, and participate in this transition while giving those who uh, are uh, better off an opportunity to really uh, invest their capital to make all of that happen rather than necessarily uh, be the ones who are receiving that funding. So I, I think it goes a long way towards that. And I, I'll just mention one other thing, uh, you know, uh, you can ask why isn't this all carbon linked? Why aren't you doing this with carbon taxes? And part of the reason for that is that by focusing on clean energy and providing this, uh, you know, what is effectively funding to make sure that it's really clean everywhere and that the clean uh, is given a good deal of, uh, you know, that anyone who puts in clean energy gets the funding, it, it doesn't solely focus on carbon, it acknowledges the historical injustices associated with environmental impacts that are not carbon, and is providing that financing in communities that otherwise, uh, what maybe, maybe perhaps would not be relevant from a carbon perspective, but still have uh, could benefit from clean energy rather than necessarily the carbon emissions reductions alone. Uh, and so that, there's there's an additional component to this, I think, that was intentional that really is about making sure that we're not just uh, uh, focusing on the global benefits, but making sure that we're paying for what can really improve health on the ground and, again, reduce costs so that those communities uh, who've historically been burdened are not the ones who are paying for this transition. Yeah, but I'll, I'll follow up more along the lines of what Uday was saying right there, um, you know, so the CPP is not an emissions reductions program per se, but obviously you're going to get substantial emissions reductions as you increase your clean, clean electricity resource deployment, you're pushing out fossil fuel plants. And so, you know, we have done and, and others have done um, analysis on, on what that means. And so, you know, there um, was a 
study that NRDC and EDF did um, that, again, driving 80% clean by 2030 um, will lead to, um, let's see, I've, I've got my figures right here, so sorry, but so, so you know, substantial, 80, almost, um, you know, over 80% uh, uh, reduction in CO2 emissions uh, from 2005, and 93% reduction in uh, SO2 emissions and 76% reductions in NOx emissions. Um, there was a clean energy future study that found that deploying clean electricity to achieve 100% clean by 2040 would lead to $1.8 trillion in climate and public health benefits. And so, you know, this is, you know, we go on, we're going beyond just, you know, talking about jobs and economic impacts. We're also talking about health impacts, um, public health impacts, and, and, you know, just a cleaner environment across the board. Thanks so much. I'll pass it over to Dan for the next question. Great. Thanks, Amber. Um, lots and lots of questions. But um, Avon, you and Udai have talked about sort of how specifically the Clean Electricity Performance Program and the tax incentives um, work together. Um, the four things that we've talked about today exist in the same conversation because of decisions that have been made on Capitol Hill, dictated in large part by the process that we're working, the, the constraints of the process. But these are four things that don't naturally always, you, would, you wouldn't think they would naturally go together in the wild, right? These are four things that have been sort of assembled in the conversation. I'd like to start, and I think actually starting, Yvonne, with you this time, and then going backwards through the list, love to hear some additional comments about how these four separate policies would work in tandem and complement each other specifically um if, you know how they would work together but also how they might impact emissions reductions or climate resilience improvements in different sectors or across different sectors um you know for a staff person who's watching us today they may be primarily interested in one of the four things that we've talked about but i'd like to try to help them understand that oh if we make progress say on clean electricity performance program these are maybe some additional benefits that would accrue to other sectors or across other sectors of the economy. So Yvonne, we'll start with you and then we'll go to Udai and then we'll go sure. backwards. To sure. this. Um, well, as, we're, as we look outside of just the power sector, um, you know, there, there, there are other um, proposals uh, in, in, you know, what, what the House has put on the table, but you really, you know, power sector is the key um, to driving, you know, emissions reductions economy-wide, right? And so as you look at policies to um, increase the amount of electrification in our buildings and transportation, so, you know, getting more EVs on the road, you know, we, we you know, those won't be clean if you're still just, you know, charging those EVs with power that's made from fossil generation, right? And so, you know, having a clean electricity power sector um, is key to furthering our goals um, across the economy. Um, and, you know, some of the other things and, and how like, you know, the rural electric programs um, will help and kind of work in tandem with the CEPP tax credits, um, you know, rural communities, uh, rural rural, co rural electric cooperatives, you know, they're primarily fossil fuel fire, they have a lot of debt. And so, you know, providing them, you know, funding and, and you know, financial means to help them with this transition and then help them um, then, you know, be able to take advantage of a CEPP um, is, are, are very important. And so, you know, there's a lot of components throughout the, the, um, the reconciliation package that are focused on climate that all do work in tandem. Um, but, you know, we just think that, you know, power sector, first of all, it's the easiest one to do right now, but it's also key to kind of helping push um, reductions in the rest of the economy. Yeah, take it away, Uday. Sure, and uh, I'll, I'll compliment what Yvonne uh, was saying here with um, a little bit more detail on kind of the, the way in which the tax incentives and CPP work together, which is that, um, it, you know, the, the CPP in many ways doesn't uh, 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 provide additional benefits until essentially after a, a, a utility uh, has done kind of some basic uh, uh, investment in clean energy. It's, you can think of it as uh, it cuts in after one and a half percent, 
of increase. And in some sense, what it's doing is it's really providing that extra incentive, that extra push for utilities to go above and beyond to really do more than they otherwise would would have done with these with the existing incentives in place. We've had them around for a long time. We're fixing some of the problems, but we don't yet know that they're going to be effective enough to drive a, a change as quickly as we need. And we don't know that that change, um, especially, uh, is going to be you know that the tax incentives alone are going to be enough to make sure that that change doesn't end up raising rates because customers have to keep paying for the old assets they already have in place, which is that cold debt issue and the new assets that are going to be put in all at the same time. And the CEPP really helps with fixing that problem by kicking in to say, if you go more rapidly, we've got your back. We're going to make sure that we cover you to address these additional costs, the hit on your communities that needed to move earlier. And that's what that CEPP really is adding. And when you, uh, but, but that's still kind of utility and electricity sector focused alone. We really also have a workforce that doesn't just need money, but needs, uh, uh, needs support and needs opportunities to dive in, needs training. And that's where really, you know, we see the, uh, the core as being complementary. And finally, uh, this isn't just about, you know, utilities making investments alone. There's a real opportunity for to improve the building stock, improve you know the, the the all of the different pieces of our economy that could contribute. In particular, households and businesses uh, in rural and disadvantaged communities need to be part of that solution. I, I think that's where you get the complementary piece of making sure this isn't just utilities investing in big things, but those investments are happening on the ground. Thanks, Kate. Yeah, I think um, just to add on or maybe put a finer point on uh, uh, amplify Uday's point about that, uh, you know, making sure that the tax credits are reaching properly the, the entity, right? So electric co-ops, for example, are not, this is not true of all co-ops, but electric co-ops are not for profit. Um, and so tax credits don't reach them the way it would a, a for-profit company. Um, so I think that's, you know, really making sure that, that those uh, pieces are kind of aligned. Um, but then also I think the thing that really stood out to me and kind of got me excited at the potential was with, with what the core network was talking about um, around really improving um, the workforce development around licensing and skill building. Um, and, uh, you know, I think in a dream world could help form kind of worker co-ops, right? Um, and have more people have those, those ownership opportunities um, and, and be that workforce that partners with um, the implementers of the Rural Energy Savings Program. And Hannah and Danielle, I think that means the core network gets the last word. Yeah, I think as folks have mentioned earlier, um, I think there is an opportunity with, as we switch to a more sustainable, greener energy system, there's a lot of opportunity to do some workforce training. Um, it's something that cores are already doing in some areas to you know, build and install that infrastructure. Um, we do have different models out there that some of our cores are doing around pre-apprenticeships um, and actually working with different uh, industry partners. Um, we also, you know, especially in like rural communities where there might not be too many other job opportunities, I think there's a, a huge opportunity there to do some uh, workforce development. And I don't know if you want to add anything, Danielle. You got it. Yeah, we. Uh, I think we're a good pipeline to workforce development and you know it all i think the ccc has a great potential of uh making that workforce look like the face of our country today so i think it, it's a wonderful opportunity for all of us thank you danielle and that's a great point to end on um that brings us to about the 3 30 mark which is the end of our time together um amber thank you very much for moderating our q a today um, I would like to thank everyone in our audience for joining us today. And thank you uh, to our panelists, Hannah and Danielle, Kate, Uday and Yvonne for four excellent presentations. Um, and I really appreciate how you're able to help sort of tie these, uh, these policies and programs and investments together. Thank you very much for joining us today. It's the start of a very busy and potentially very consequential week in climate policy in the United States. So um, I couldn't think of a better way to kick it off. Um, and I forgot to mention in my remarks, but one of the reasons why we decided to focus on the jobs aspect is because they're very real and they do in fact materialize with these investments, but September is also workforce development month. Um, and so we've got to get that in there before the end of the month. 
um, as well, because it's a great time of year to um, um, make these points. So thank you so much for these great presentations. Reminder about slides, if you missed anything, um, you are welcome in our audience. Everything will be posted online. I didn't mention this during my introductions because I didn't want to create sort of the illusion of maybe playing favorites among panelists, but Danielle and Hannah, thank you for including a photo of a blower door test. Um, I'm an energy efficiency person, so anytime we can get a blower door test image in a set of slides and at an ESI briefing, it's brownie points. So thank you very much. If you want to go back and look at Hannah's and Danielle's slides or um, Kate's or Udai's or Yvonne's, everything will be posted online, as well as the archive of the webcast and eventually summary notes. Um, thank you that, uh, for that. Um, I would like to say thank you to everyone um, at Team EESI who helps bring these briefings um, to our audience. Um, that starts with Dan O'Brien. Um, I'd also like to thank Omri, Emma, Amber, of course, Savannah and Anna. And I'd like to thank our fabulous fall interns, Isabella, Roshni and Valerie for helping with notes and live streaming and Twitter and all of that. So thank you all for a great effort today. Um, Dan O uh, will put up a slide in just a moment with a link to a survey. Um, we take this very seriously. If you have, if folks in our audience have two minutes and you're willing to click on that link or copy it into your browser, um, it really, really does help us if you share your thoughts about what you heard today. If there are any technical issues, any video issues, any audio issues, any ideas for future topics, uh, commentary uh, on what you heard, everything is welcome. We read every response and we do our best to improve. Um, after we get the results of each survey after each briefing. Um, so I really, really appreciate that. Um, I've plugged the website a bunch of times, but that's because it's a great resource. I'd also like to plug once again, our biweekly newsletter. Amber is our editor, Climate Change Solutions. It comes out every other Tuesday, which means I think the next issue is tomorrow. Um, and it's a great resource. Um, also like to plug our upcoming uh, briefing series that kicks off next Friday with Sir Robert Watson and Christiana Figueres uh, to talk about, um, to begin our discussions in the lead up to COP26. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. I hope everyone has a great rest of your Monday and uh, it means a lot for you joining us. Thank you so much. <laughs>